wonder if you can think of a time when you felt unsafe. Or I wonder if you can imagine a time when you felt a little uncertain. Perhaps you weren't clear on what the next steps might be for where you are at. I will confess that this week, as I was thinking about this question, I realized that I have lived an incredibly privileged life. I was trying to come up with some like cute little anecdote with which to start this. It's like, oh, here was this time I felt deeply unsafe. I got nothing. Uh, and so for that, I am very grateful. But I did come up with a time when I felt unclear on what came next. I was just finishing up uh, my master's program. I was preparing to prepare uh, or to apply for some PhD programs. I had felt called since I was 16 years old to go and teach God's word. I felt like this is what God wanted me to do. And yet I still had that creeping suspicion that I just was not going to be good enough. And all of these thoughts had been roiling around in my brain for weeks and weeks. And so there was finally one day I was um, in the shower, because that's where I do my best thinking, of course, um, and just started spinning out and thinking, I'm not going to get into a PhD program. And what can I do with a master's in theology? There's no hope for me. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to live in a box down by the river. And so I get out of the shower. I am sobbing. I wrap myself in a towel. I go find my husband, Jeremiah, in the kitchen. And I have this complete breakdown telling him, you know, I'm going to be homeless and living by the side of the river. My spouse is a saint. Uh, he very calmly talked me through this, helped me see the next step and helped inspire in me a confidence that I could know what the next step might be. At that moment, God was working through my spouse to provide me with a sense of refuge. Now in our text today from Psalm 31 and from 1 Peter 2, we find audiences that are in a similar position. Audiences that seem to be struggling with Feelings of unsafety, feelings of dis-ease, feelings of uncertainty. And what we find in both of these texts is that the writers look to God as a source of comfort and confidence. Biblical scholar Joel Lamont looks at Psalm 31 and suggests that what we might find in this text is actually an idea of the psalmist being a refugee. If we go back to that, you'll notice that there are several times that the psalmist uses the word refuge. So verse 1, in you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Verse 2, be a rock of refuge for me. Verse 4, you are my refuge. Now, my story, of course, is not one of being a literal refugee. I have been, had a lot of privilege in my life. I have not had to endure that kind of instability. And yet our psalmist here, even in the midst of utter instability, looks to God as a refuge. What is also striking to me is how quickly the psalmist seems to move from petition to confidence. So in verse 2, God, be a rock of refuge for me. And then just one sentence later, well, you are indeed my rock and my refuge. Whew, that was quick. That is not a kind of move to confidence that I can make. It takes me a little longer to get there. But our psalmist gets there in a single sentence. And I wonder how. What is it that has inspired the psalmist to move from a place of, please God, let this be, to, yes, God, I know that this is true. And I wonder if what we might see between those sentences is the power of the community gathered to share the confidence that we can have in God. I think of my moment sobbing in the kitchen to my husband and the way that in that moment he was able to speak life and faith and confidence into me when I did not have that. Are there ways that the community and the body of Christ gathered around us can be that hope when we are hopeless? Now, we move on from uh, the psalm to the text of 1 Peter, written now at a very different time in the church's life. 
I suspect that with this congregation, I will hopefully not scandalize any of you if I tell you that First Peter was probably not written by Peter. We're okay. Nobody is walking out. I don't see any rotten tomatoes. Okay. Most biblical scholars will suggest that First Peter is actually not written by the Apostle Peter, but is written later in the development of the early Christian life probably sometime in the late first century. Now, if that's indeed the case, what we know from uh, the third century church historian Eusebius is that towards the end of the first century, things were looking a little dicey for the early Christians. Um, Domitian, Emperor Domitian comes to power in 89, and according to Eusebius, um, Domitian was not a real big fan of the early Christians, and they were kind of on his radar for persecution. So if this is, in fact, the historical time period when this letter is being written, we might imagine a people that are pretty uneasy. Are they going to live? Are they going to survive? Are their families going to be okay? This is a time of quite a lot of questions and worry. And yet what we find in this letter that first that is in first Peter is that the author looks at the situation of the audience and says, this isn't the first time this has happened. You weren't the first ones for whom things have been difficult. And so what the letter does is draw the audience's attention to the history of the people of Israel. Look how God was faithful then. Draws their attention to the person of Jesus Christ. Look how God was faithful in Christ. And finally then, it turns to the audience themselves as if to say, the God who has been faithful through all this history, of course, will be faithful to you. What we find then is a sort of connection. The people of Israel, the person of Jesus, the audience to whom the letter is connected, all three face threats. All three were in difficult situations, and yet all three were preserved by God. In God, they can find refuge. Now, I don't have all the time in the world this morning um, to unpack the many ways that First uh, Peter does this, but if we were to look at just the small little section of text that we read for today, what we would find is that the author is quoting from the Psalms, from Isaiah, from Exodus, and from Hosea, four different books in just eight little verses that we read for today. There is a lot of connection back to the people of Israel, as if to say, look, God was faithful then, God will also be faithful now. Beyond that, the author of 1 Peter draws the audience's attention to Christ. What we find as we look at the descriptions of Christ on the one hand and the descriptions of the audience on the other is that time and time again, they are connected. Both Jesus and the audience are living stones, the author says. Both Jesus and the audience are rejected by others. Both Jesus and the audience are elected by God and both Jesus and the audience are honored by God. What God did for Jesus, God will also do for you, the readers of this letter. There is a way in which the letter provides comfort and confidence in the connection between Christ and those who follow in his footsteps. Now today, I recognize that for many of us, we have been in positions of privilege. For many of us, we've not necessarily experienced the uncertainty of being literal refugees. Some of us have, but for some of us, we have just experienced times of uncertainty, times of doubt. Even we as a church right now, as we have said goodbye to Pastor Arthur and wonder what is next, for our community pastor position, we are in a time of some questions. What comes next? Can we have confidence that God will be faithful? And what our texts from both the Psalm and from 1 Peter assure us 
is that if we look to the history of God's work with God's people throughout all of time, God has been faithful. We can find refuge in God. And in those moments where we struggle to believe that for ourselves, in those moments when we can't quite make the move from saying, God, be my refuge, to being able to su suggest that, yes, God, you are my refuge, in those times, may we look to each other to carry the faith for us. And so today, as we join in a few moments around the communion table, as we join ourselves to Christ, we also join ourselves to one another. And in that joining, my prayer is that we would be able to assert together that yes, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Amen.